to the book of John, chapter 1. I'm going to start there, John, chapter 1. I'm going to talk to you about probably the greatest subject in the Bible tonight. I want to talk to you tonight about the fact that we are part of his family, part of the family of God. Amen? John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So here, he's talking about the fact that we have been made, we were given the right to become children of God. I think quite honestly that uh, mo there's probably many days that go by in our life where we take that simple fact completely for granted. I mean, my goodness, is there any greater truth? Is there, is there any greater fact in, in anything that we've ever read, anything we've ever known in all of history than the fact that the God of the universe decided to make us part of his family? That, that just blows me away every time I think about it. Why would God even want me to be part of his family? You know, and I'm not saying it like, oh, I'm just this despicable human. You know, how could I, he ever want to be around me? It's not that. It's that that is a tremendous honor. And why would he want to bestow that upon us? Because uh, the angels are not sons of God. You know, there are other heavenly beings that we read about in Scripture. They're not sons of God. Why us? Why, why would he make us sons and daughters I was reading this week in Ezekiel chapter 1. And how many of you have read that where Ezekiel is just kind of going about his thing and all of a sudden the God of the universe reveals himself to him. And he's doing his best to describe it. I mean, when you read, when you read Ezekiel chapter 1, he's trying to describe it. He's constantly using words like, and it, it had the appearance of this, but it wasn't really that, but it had the appearance of a man, but it wasn't a man. And on this side, it had the, it had the appearance of a lion and the appearance of an eagle, appearance, you know. But he's trying so hard to describe it, but he's, he's beholding the God of the universe. And I was reading that this week. I just couldn't get over it. I read it over and over. It takes him three chapters to, to describe what he's seeing. And it's not the only time in the book of Ezekiel that he sees this. But, but basically what he sees is he sees these four beings. Undoubtedly, they're beings that God created. He says they have the form of a man, but they're not really a man. They've got the face of a man, face of a lion, face of an ox, face of an eagle, four wings. You know, they're these magnificent creatures. And I don't believe that it's symbolic what he's seeing because John, when he sees the throne of God, describes the same thing. So the heavens are open and God's throne is coming out of the clouds. And Ezekiel's just sitting here seeing this. And he sees these four creatures and it's almost like they're supporting the throne. It's above him, there's this expanse and on top of it's the throne. And it's like these beings are created to, to be constantly at the throne. It's almost attendance there. One of the interesting things he mentions about the beings is he says they're these, this kind of always stump people trying to imagine this, but he says there's, there's like these wheels within a wheel. You know, and I was looking on the internet trying to find different artist depictions of what they thought uh, this was. But what was so interesting about the wheels, it's like a wheel within a wheel, so a wheel going this way and then a wheel inside of it going this way. And it says the rims of the wheel were covered with eyes. And it's almost like those eyes are just looking to and fro, watching, seeing all of humanity constantly as like a, uh, just a, a way for God to see and know everything that's going on. And, of course, when John describes God, you know, he's, he's on his face. Isaiah sees him. He's on his face. I mean, nobody can even behold the glory of the Lord. Moses gets around it, and he comes out after 40 days shining so bright that they have to put a veil over his face. <laughs> and this God wanted to make us sons and daughters wanted to make us part of his family that that just blows me away especially when you think of the treason that our race committed and i know we might be thinking well i didn't ever commit it yeah but it was our race that did it 
And, it's, and, and, and Paul says that by Adam's sin, it was imparted to all of us his iniquity. And so God, I'm, I'm always overwhelmed by this fact that God, you know, when Adam and Eve did that, he had no obligation to redeem them whatsoever. Matter of fact, in his, in his justice, he would have been completely fair to punish them to hell along with Satan because really their sin was equivalent to Satan's. And, and I think the thing that I'm so thankful for is when I think about that Satan rebelled against God and he did not receive mercy. Now, this is a created being of God too. Don't think for one second that God did not love Satan as well. God loved Satan. He loved those angels. They were close. They were servants of God. But when they rebelled against him, they did not receive any mercy, but they were punished eternally. Don't you think for one second that that couldn't have been us? That the whole race could have remained damned forever and we could have taken our part with Satan. He was under no obligation to show us mercy. He was no under, under no obligation to show us love. He was, no under, it was under no obligation to save us or redeem us much less make us sons and daughters. Because you realize that he could have saved us without making us sons and daughters, right? Amen. I mean, he could, have just, he could have just made us, well, you're not going to hell, and you, know, you get to be in heaven with me like the rest of the angels. Think about the story of the prodigal son. That's kind of what the prodigal son was expecting. You know, when he came back to his father... After wasting the whole inheritance, he didn't imagine that the, son, that the father would receive him back as a son. That wasn't even an option. He said, I know he's not going to do that, but at the very least, he, he might let me be a servant. He might let me be a servant in the household of God, maybe just taking care of some of the animals. He'll never restore me as a son. But that was exactly what he did. He restored him back as a son. Don't you think that could have been us? Don't you think that God could have just made us servants in heaven somehow, sort of like the angels? How many of you would have been grateful for that rather than going to hell? But he said, not only am I going to save you and redeem you, I'm going to adopt you into my family to where you become sons and daughters of the king. I don't think we understand this. I really don't. I don't think we have a full revelation of this because I think many of us walk around in our life feeling condemned, and I, I'll use this word, even unloved by the king. But, and, feel, and almost feeling like we have to earn his love or like we have to earn our salvation. We have to earn his righteousness. The thing about it is, salvation does have to be earned. But Jesus earned it. It did have to be earned. Salvation, there, salvation is through works. <laughs> it was through his works. He had to come. He had to live a perfect life. He had to earn it. He had to live a perfect life, and he did it. He obeyed the law fully and, in effect, earned our salvation. Now, I don't fully understand why Adam's sin was imputed to me. I don't fully understand why Jesus' righteousness was imputed to me, but it was. And it's the way that God sees it. And when he sees that Jesus walked and lived and earned salvation as a perfect vessel on this earth... It's as if you did it when you accept him and you put your faith in him. You know, the way, I, the way I believe the Lord related it to me one time as I was really praying and thinking about this, because this is an issue when you start talking to sinners, you start talking to unbelievers, and you start letting them know, you know, well, you're a sinner and you have to receive the sacrifice of Jesus if you're going to be made right with God. In some people's mind, they're like, well, what did I ever do? I mean, yeah, I mean, what do you mean I'm a sinner? What have I done? What's the problem here? You know, why am I going to hell if I don't accept Jesus? Well, I like to look at it a co like a couple ways. Number one, hell is everyone's default location. When, when, by, by effect of things that have happened in the past, hell is your default location. You're, it's not that you're even necessarily doing anything to deserve to go there right away, but that's your default location. Sort of like... Slavery. This is, this is something that the Lord showed me one time as I was really trying to understand this and get a grasp on it, is that it's really like slavery was, you know, years ago. Uh, if someone was born into slavery on the plantation, well, they didn't do anything to deserve it. 
They just were born into a particular type of family that controlled their destiny. However they were born controlled their destiny. They didn't get to choose which family they were born in, didn't get to choose the color of their skin, didn't get to choose anyone. That Just by nature of being born, their destiny was picked for them. Can you imagine if a plantation owner came to one of the children born into slavery? He already knows his destiny, already knows my life. He's been around his family and fathers and everybody else, his color. And he knows what his destiny, he can look around the fields. He can see people 60, 70 years old out there doing, he said, this is my life. This is all I ever have to look forward to is work in these fields. This is all I ever have to look forward to. Can you imagine one of the, the plantation owners coming in and saying to one of those slaves, you didn't do anything to deserve this, but I'm giving you an invitation. I want to adopt you as my son. I already have sons and everything they're entitled to, you're entitled to. You get to come eat at my table. You get to wear the clothes that my other sons wear. You get to have the inheritance that my other sons have. When I, when I pass away and I die, you get, you get a piece of this estate just like the rest of my other sons. Why? Because he was adopted into, their, into that family. I hope you're seeing the picture because that's exactly what happened with us. We were born into slavery. As a matter of fact, Paul uses that example. He uses that word slavery. He says, you're no longer slaves, but sons. No longer slaves, but sons of God. He, he, he came to us for whatever reason, and he adopted us. Now, again, think back to this example. We're using the plantation owner could have came to the slave, and he could have said, I release you. He could have just let him go. He could have said, you don't have to be a slave anymore. I, I free you from slavery. You're on your own. He'd have had no inheritance, wouldn't have been able to sit at the table. It, would, it wouldn't have had the clothes, wouldn't have had the nice things, but he would have been free from slavery at the very least. God could have done that with us. He could have just set us free from hell. He didn't have to make us sons, but he made us sons and daughters, adopted us into his family. And if you can, if you can grasp this, says that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. How is that possible? You're telling me that the inheritance that Jesus has waiting for him is waiting for me? Well, that's what a joint heir means. It means we're co-sharers in the inheritance. This might be going over some of your heads. I mean, I think somebody's kind of looking at me like, huh? Look. I'm telling you, this is the message of the New Testament. This is the gospel, the good news. You did not deserve it. You were a slave. You had an eternal destination going to hell. And he picked you out of it and gave you a way that you could become a son or a daughter of the king with an eternal inheritance, the same eternal inheritance that he puts upon Jesus himself. It's amazing. Ephesians chapter 2 Verse 1, it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, see, by nature, we were children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Now, I've pondered, you know, this, this subject many times in prayer, and I've, I've talked with God about it. You know, I've talked with God about the fact that, as he said, you were, you were children of wrath like the rest of mankind. The fact that, that man, unless they change, unless they repent, they're going to eternity to spend eternity in hell. And uh, I'm not happy about it. And I know you're not happy about it. And God's not happy about it. That people are actually going to hell every day. So I think because some people are not happy about it. They've, they've actually made different doctrines. Where hell doesn't even exist anymore. But hell does exist. And I think one of the most. I think one of the most irresponsible things you can do. Is say or, or act like hell does not exist and that people are not going there. 
How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have ever been to a funeral where the person in the casket was going to hell and the preacher said so? <laughs> I haven't. As far as I know, every funeral I've ever been to, that person's gone to heaven according to the preacher. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not going to be the first to get up there and say this person went to hell at a funeral. But I might tell them I'm not doing the funeral <laughs> because I'm not going to get up there and lie. I'm not going to get up there and say that. Matter of fact, I, I've, I've had to do a funeral that was a, a very difficult funeral, and, and uh, I, di I didn't say that. You know, I didn't say, that the, I didn't say either way, but the thing is, is that there were people in the audience that were living the same way that the person in the casket was living before he died, and the last thing they need to hear is the fact that you can live that way and everything's going to be okay, still go to heaven. That's not true, and I'll tell you, I'm not happy about it. I'm not happy that people are going to hell. But the Lord related to me like this. If you are on an on a airplane and you're flying across the Atlantic and the, the stewardess comes out and she says, guys, we got bad news. <laughs> Engines have gone out and the plane is going down. There's only one way off of this plane. We have a parachute for each of you. You got to jump. <laughs> That's the only way. Are you not going to make it? Now, you might have people on the plane and say, uh-uh, I ain't doing that. There's got to be another way. Get those engines working. Go back in the cockpit and tell the captain. Get, You know, you can sit there and argue with the stewardess all day. But there's one way off of that airplane. You can devise your own way. You can try to come up with your own way. But there's one way off it that's going to end in salvation and it's doing what the stewardess said. And I really feel like that's the case the world's in. People get all flustered about the fact, well, there's only, Jesus is the only way. Well, that just doesn't seem right. Jesus is the only way. Look, it's not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of preference. He is the only way. That's what God's trying to tell us. He's like the steward is standing there going, look, it's, I can't make it any different. This is what it is. He's the only way. I'm, I'm giving the invitation to everyone. Take the parachute and jump out if you know what's good for you. And then he sends people like us to proclaim it and shout it to them and say, this is the only way. Do not be fooled. I guess in the meantime, you got a, <laughs> to further the illustration, you got a, a, a devil of a passenger standing up and saying, well, this ain't the only way. If you'll just, I've been through this before. If you'll just hang out on this plane, it's gonna, everything's going to be okay. No, it's not. <laughs> Do not listen to that passenger. But you know, that's what we have. And I think sometimes it helps us to think about it in different terms than what we're always used to because we've got to realize what, what we're a part of here and, and why God had to come and send Jesus and, and, and why he had to redeem mankind and the way it had to be. How many of you just trust God that it's, it's the way it is because it's the way it had to be? It's the way it is because it's the way it had to be. I, I mean, if we can all sit there and say, you know, that we fully understand everything, but I do believe this, I do believe that just as there were laws written by God get, given to us in a book, I believe that there are eternal laws that were written in eternity before man was ever even created, laws that govern the universe, laws that govern heaven, that, that have to be abided by, and I, I can say that that has something to do with the reason why things had to be the way that they are. But you know, everybody does not choose to be a son of God. John chapter 8, verse 43, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He says, why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Did you know that the devil had children too? Because that's what he just said. He looked at the Pharisees and he said, you are of your father, the devil. Now, if you're not a child of God, what are you? I mean, because people want to know, well, I mean, I'm not a bad person. Am I a child of the devil? Does that mean I'm a child of the devil? Well, if you're not a child of God, what are you? I know you might look sweet on the outside, but if you're not saved, then what are you? If you're not a child of God, what are you? And I, I, I dealt with this whenever my son was born. 
you know, I'm looking at him. He's pure and sweet and precious. And I'm looking at him thinking, knowing what I know about Scripture, I'm thinking, you know, until this young man receives Jesus, he is not a child of God. There will come a point in his life until he has to, uh, there will come a point in his life where he has to receive God for himself. His daddy's faith and his mama's faith is not going to do it. He's got to receive it himself. And until he's going to have to, like everybody else, he is going to have to be born again. I'm looking at him, you know, today is the day of his birth, but he's going to have to be reborn or else he's not a child of God. And I'm looking at my son, how can this be? Well, as he started growing up, I began to see it. I began to figure out real quick. I understand why he's a child of the... No, I'm just kidding. But I begin to see real quick, and my, sometimes we'll look at it and say, my son, you just need to get saved. That's the problem here. You just need to receive Jesus and be born again. I'm praying for you. Anyway. I think Dakota came out saved because she's just so sweet. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Turn there if you would. Romans 8, 14. It says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. Are you getting this? If children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I think... We, it would do us good to meditate on this for several weeks, just, to, just on that one fact, meditate on, the, meditate on the fact that we, you can meditate on it too, <laughs> as, as medicine to your flesh, meditate on the fact, I'm a joint heir. I am a joint heir. Would you, can you, could you ever get tired of thinking about that? Could you ever get tired of thinking about what that means? Matter of fact, you cannot understand what that means. You cannot fully even begin to comprehend what that means except the Spirit of God reveal it to you. That's why he said that, he said, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it even entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him, but he has revealed it to us by his Spirit, meaning that we can't even, we, with your natural mind, you can't comprehend it's so much beyond your mind to even comprehend the things that God has prepared for you. You've never heard anything like what he has prepared for you. It's never, there's never been even an imagination enter into the heart of man that would compare with what God has prepared for you. The only way you could possibly understand it is the Spirit of God reveal it to you. That's how amazing it is and how powerful it is. You know, I've watched some movies. I, the first time I think it ever happened was when I was a child, uh, really young. And I watched The Land Before Time. Do you guys just see that dinosaur movie? I mean, I watched that. Why did I ever get to watch that? That was so sad. The little kid loses his mama and daddy like he's tormented for life. But anyway, uh, it was horrible. I was really affected by that. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> but I do remember at the end, and, you know, they think everything's destroyed. All the dinosaurs are destroyed. And uh, Sharp Tooth has been chasing them around for hours. And then they come over this hill... And do you remember what they see? They come over this hill and it's like waterfalls and green grass and mountain. And before they were just like, they're little, they were just so happy to find a little leaf. And, you know, there's just green grass and waterfalls and lakes and sunshine and rainbows. And I remember seeing that thinking, man, if heaven is just that awesome, then we'd be good. I would be so happy for eternity. And then, you know, as time goes on, you watch different movies and I've seen now with all the digital cinematography stuff, they create these, you know, sci-fi worlds. And, and you're just like, wow, if heaven's like that. But he said, none of that. He said, that, see, that's an imagination that's entered into the heart of man. And it does not compare with the reality of heaven. It does not compare with the inheritance that he has for you. You know, he says he's got mansions prepared for us. And, and you think, when you think of a mansion, you think about something you've seen over there in Landmark. Or across the street from Landmark, that big one. 
that, that don't compare to what God has prepared for you. And I don't mean it's bigger or anything like that. I'm just saying you can't even comprehend. I mean, the streets are made out of gold. Where are you going to go from there? The gates are made out of pearls. I mean, the, you know, gold, to us, it's so valuable. To them, they just walk on it. I mean, they just make streets out of it. You can't even imagine what God has prepared. I love to think about this because I think about, you know, there's two instances that I, that I remember from Scripture right offhand where one is where Paul, he's called up to the third heaven and he says, certain things that I saw, I was not permitted to even write about. What is that? That's probably part of our inheritance right there. That's some stuff that God's got prepared for us that didn't even enter into the heart of man. Why couldn't he talk about it? Why, why couldn't he express it? What about John the other time in John in the book of Revelations where he's seeing this whole vision in the book of Revelation, which he revealed quite a bit in that book. I mean... How many if no, there's enough stuff in there to get excited about already. But he sees something and he goes to write it down. The angel says, don't write that down. Don't write that part down. Well, what is that? Just lets us know for, that there's more than we've ever even imagined. More than we can ever see. And I think our thinking on this is so small, but I think it's good to meditate on it and realize we have an inheritance that he cannot even imagine. What about this? I know we're kind of, I'm just kind of stimulating your imagination. These are all the crazy things that I think about from time to time. But what about this? You know, it says that when he comes at the, at the end of, of all things, that the, the heavens, the earth, and the, the, the earth and the heavens are restored. New heavens, new earth. Now, I think sometimes we only think about the, the earth being restored. That's not what he said. He said the heavens, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And when you look up the word heavens there, it's really, it's really talking about the universe. It's not talking about the cloud in the sky place that we think about. He's talking about the universe. Which, when you look at the universe and you see all the, the planets, billions, billions, billions of, of planets, and they can't even find the end of it. It doesn't matter how big they make the... The, the, the telescope, they'll never find the end of it. But you know what I look at those planets and think? Those planets look cursed to me. <laughs> they, they, it doesn't look like the earth was, was, was cursed and everything else stayed vibrant, stayed creative. But no, I see darkness. I see chaos. I see, you know, there's no life. Does that sound like something God created and intended it to be that way? No, because it's probably going to be restored. The, how far did the curse stretch when the, when the earth was cursed and this whole thing was cursed? How far did that extend? Was it just planet earth or did it go beyond that? Why am I even saying that tonight? Well, because our minds need to expand on what we're thinking about. Oh, there's just going to be a new earth. No, it says the whole heavens are going to be recreated. You look out, you think you know what Mars is like. Well, not when God gets done recreating it. You think you know what Earth is like. Not when God gets done recreating it. What does he have planned for us? That's why people think so small, you know, and, and even in the parable of the stewards where the, the master returns and he says, you've been faithful in much. And he says, now I will make you ruler over 10 cities. Well, that gives us a picture. That gives us an idea of some things that are waiting for us in eternity. That they'll, apparently there'll be different levels of leadership, different levels of, of ruling. Why am I talking about this? Because I want us to grasp and get a small taste and a small understanding of the inheritance. Not only now. Praise God we have an inheritance now, but it's not only now. There's an eternal in inheritance, and we're supposed to live with that in view. Live with that in mind. It should affect the, the decisions we make and, and the way that we live. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. This may sound like I'm reading the same scripture in Romans 8, but it's different scripture because he's kind of sharing the same thing. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. He says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law 
in order that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Sounds so similar to Romans chapter 8, but he's just recommunicating the same thing because this is central to the gospel. This is central to what took place on the cross. We've got to get past this fact of, uh, well, not get past it. We should always be in awe of it, but we do, in a sense, have to get past the fact that we've been forgiven. Praise God, we've been forgiven, but we've been much more than forgiven. We've been much more than saved from hell. We were adopted as sons and daughters into his family. We're sons and daughters of the king, and we have an heir, we have an inheritance that is waiting for us that's both now and in eternity. You know, when I think about this, I think more than anything, this really demonstrates the incredible love that he must have for us. I mean, think about it. He wanted us part of his family. Didn't do it because he had to. Didn't do it because he was obligated to. Didn't do it because he didn't want us to go to hell. We've already covered that. He could have got us out of hell without making us sons. It really demonstrates the tremendous love that he must have for us to make us part of his family. Now, how many of you are willing to make somebody part of your family? Make a stranger part of your family? Just go out on the street and find somebody you feel sorry for and just, you know, adopt them into your family. And not only that, giving them inheritance of everything you have. You wouldn't do that unless you had a tremendous love for that person. And this was one of the first things, this is how God, this is how God hooked me was with an understanding of the love that he had for me. When I got saved, that is what led me to salvation was the first time that I ever experienced God, I experienced his love. And I'll never forget it. It's as real to me today as it was then. We were at a youth camp and I went down to the front to get prayed for. Didn't feel nothing. Wasn't, you know, just as carnal as could be. Went down to the front to get prayed for. And while I was at that altar, the love of God overwhelmed me. The love of God hit me, and I guess, I, could, I guess my eyes were open because for the first time, I understood the tremendous love, not just that he had for humanity, but that he had for me. And it was so intense that I laid on the floor and wept for three hours. Now, this is a teenager. I was 15 years old, and one minute unmoved by the things of God. Matter of fact, years unmoved because I'd been in church my whole life, never moved by, oh, Jesus loves me. Yeah, I've heard that since I was a kid. I know that. But when I experienced the love of God, it overwhelmed me and it changed me forever. And it set me on a course and a path to living for God and giving my life to him, giving my life to the ministry. One, one encounter with the love of God. It's not enough to know up here that he loves you. There are people in this room right now, you don't feel that he loves you. You know it up here, but you don't feel that. You walk around, even even when you try to pray, you try to be a Christian, you don't feel that love. But I want you to understand that he loves you more than you can possibly imagine. I know we're all Christians in here and we know that. But it's not enough to know it up here. You have to know, not that he loves humanity. We know that. Not that he loves the world or that he loves sinners or that he loves anybody else in this room. But that he loves you more than you, than you can imagine. And when I first understood that, it, it just overwhelmed me. And I remember some, some dark times in my life after that and periods of just dryness and, and struggling to... to to feel anything, you know, it was that one experience that sustained me through those times because I could look back to that one experience and go, no, I know because I remember that. I never forget it. That was more real to me than anything I'd ever experienced. And no matter how I feel right now, 
the love of God overwhelmed me in that moment, and he has not changed towards me. He has not changed. And I believe that this one fact that we're talking about, the fact that he adopted us into... Okay, let me even say it like this. It's not only that God loves you, he likes you. You know... I ask my wife that sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I know you love me, but do you like me? (laughs) That's what I want to (laughs) know. Because sometimes we can love people because we have to, and it's a Christian thing to do. I can love you, but I don't like you. (laughs) But God, he doesn't just love you. He he likes you. He wants to be in your company. He He likes your personality. He likes you because he created you. And he loved you and he liked you enough that he said, you know, I'm going to make that person part of my family. I think there's some of us, we'd like to do the opposite. We have people we'd like to kick out of our family, people in our family we need to get rid of because we love them, but we don't like them. (laughs) But God, you weren't even in the family and he liked you and he loved you so much that he wanted you to be a part of his family. I think the last thing that I want to say on this is... If that's how God feels about me, if that's how he feels about you, if that's how he feels about every member in the body of Christ, then what business do we have not loving or not liking somebody in the body or somebody that's part of the family? Do you know how much division there is in the body of Christ? How much ugliness there are in churches, backbiting, backstabbing, rumors, offense, With this understanding that if he's my father and he's your father, well, then we must be brothers. We we must be sister. We must be brother and sister. Y'all must be sisters. I mean, we're family, and he loves each of us with all of our quirks and all of our weirdness and all of our annoying, you know, habits. He loves us that much. Well, what business do I have not loving you? And if he likes you, What business do I have not liking you? Because Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, the student is not greater than the teacher. So if the teacher likes and the teacher loves, the student needs to just fall in line and do exactly what he does. You know, it's kind of like when you go to some of these places around here, you know, and if the manager were to come out, he'd treat you one way, but then the the employees, they're not as nice. You know, they're not as kind, and even though the manager might be telling them the customer's always right, that's what, the, that's what the teacher said, but the student ain't following that the customer's always right. We got a lot of that in the kingdom of God. We got the kingdom, we got, we've got the master, we've got the king, the head of the church, saying this is how I view this person, this is how I feel about this person. I, I'm not, they're not irritating to me. I love them. I've called them. You're the student. You just have to fall in line. And you've got to make it your effort to feel the same way about that person that he does. And if you don't feel that way, then you have to ask him to give you his eyes and his heart for that that person. I think that we understand this to a measure, but we don't really understand fully what it means to be part of the family of God and to act like the family of God to act like brothers and sisters that love one another, that bear one another in their weaknesses, that pray for one another, that promote one another. We don't, we don't act like that. But I'm believing for that spirit to be in this church. I'm believing that, and it's already here to a measure. I mean, I, people say it over and over when they walk in, the spirit that's here and, and the love that people feel. And, and I can say that. I can say truthfully that there hasn't been that. There hasn't been that divisiveness. There hasn't been that backbiting and that, you know, and I just pray, God, it's not going to be. There should be no division in the body of Christ. There should be no division in church. There should be no whispers in church. Because we're brothers, we're sisters, we're part of the family of God, and we're greatly loved by the King. And we all have the same mission. We all have the same assignment where we're going. And that's just that kind of stuff is just a distraction of the enemy to get us off of our real purpose and our real task of where we're supposed to be going. I've had people in my life that are 
you know, over me or uh, older than me in the ministry. And I've, I've had people say this to me. I hope you do better than I've ever done. I hope you go further than I've ever grown. Hope you do more in the ministry than I've ever done. And you can tell that they mean it. Why? Because they're not threatened by somebody else doing something great for God. They want you to succeed because when you succeed, I succeed. If you bring people into the kingdom, it's, we're all part of the same kingdom. We're building the kingdom of God. That's why from day one in this church, I've said, we're not the answer for Alexandria. We're part of the answer. There are other churches around that have part of the answer. We're all part. We're all building the kingdom. If somebody comes to this church and they get fed and they grow for six months, they decide to leave and go to another church. Well, they hadn't left the kingdom. They're still in the kingdom. They're not left the kingdom just because they leave this church. <laughs> I mean, unless they walk away from God. But you understand what I'm saying? People, I've been places, every time somebody gets ready to leave, oh, they're out of the will of God. They'll, they'll never do the will of God because they left this church. That's the biggest bunch of baloney. They'll do the will of God as long as they're pleasing to him. And they're still part of the kingdom. Amen. Yeah. And what about us? I don't know why I'm saying this tonight, but what about us? What if somebody does leave the church and they come back? Months later, how are we going to treat them? We're going to shun them? Oh, you finally realized the error of your ways. <laughs> now you're back. How many of you like to receive mercy? Because I do. And he says that to the one who shows mercy, mercy will be given. They will receive mercy. And that's not just now. That's when judgment day. 